Hello, my name is Reverend Christina Branna Martin, and I'm so glad to welcome you to worship today with the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Clemson. I'm the interim minister here, and today we welcome two people to our pulpit, and I'm so glad to share the space to worship together with them. Let me start with just a few announcements for today. We have a parking lot service outside with now that we can come together more safely next week on May 30th. Bring a folding chair or listen from your car through the FM transmitter and let's bridge together the transitions in our lives and also celebrate retirements and graduating seniors and children moving from one grade to another. We hope it'll be a great day and we look forward to seeing you there. On June 13th, we also have a congregational meeting in which we'll be talking about how we're gonna come back together into our building safely with compassion and equity for all those involved, especially our children and to do, the, to do so uh, with care. We have fire pit gatherings going on in May and in June and we welcome those of you to join us. We've got books we're reading and book clubs we have a camp out scheduled from June 10th to June 13th at the Oconee State Park. We have discussion groups with the Braver Angels Workshop about depolarizing within on Saturday, June 19th. We have a new UU and new, mem new members workshop on June 13th in the afternoon after our congregational meeting. So many things are going on. We also have some of the regular things such as bingo and coffee hour with me and meditation with Jean and Mondays. We have our novel circle and often we'll have our grounds work days. We are so glad to be together in so many different ways. All the details and Zoom links for these are in our newsletter. If you are new to our community and you would like to get connected to find out more about us, and to be able to join in on some of these activities, please look us up on uufc.org and we can get you connected to our newsletter. We look forward to meeting you. Thank you. We gather together in the spirit of love, with justice as our guide. This is our chosen covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth with freedom, and to care for one another. Good morning, my name is Jean Malmgren, and our opening words today come from the Vietnamese Zen priest, Tick Nhat Han. Breathing in, I am aware that I am breathing in. Breathing out, I am aware that I am breathing out. Breathing in, I am grateful for this moment. Breathing out, I smile. Breathing in, I am aware of the preciousness of this day Breathing out, I vow to live deeply in this day. Under the Bodhi Tree, a story of the Buddha. By Deborah Hopkinson, illustrated by Kaylee Whitman. In a long ago time and a faraway place, a baby boy was born. His name was Prince Siddhartha. Before his birth, his mother dreamed of a beautiful white elephant. The wise men said it was a sign the baby would be special. And he was, just like babies then and now and everywhere, and just like you. The baby grew to be a kind and gentle child, once he found a wounded swan and nursed it back to health so it could soar across the sky again. The little prince wanted to spread his wings too, 
But his father said, You must stay here, away from the world, where I can keep you safe from any pain or sorrow. And so Siddhartha grew up behind the garden walls of a rich and splendid palace. He had new, fine clothes, a grand white horse, the softest rice to eat. But like children then and now and everywhere, and just like you, he longed to discover the world. At last, when Siddhartha was a young man, his father let him visit the great city. The king ordered the mayor, hold a festival in the market with flowers, song, and dance. My son must see only happy sights. But of course, the prince was curious and wandered off to explore. And that is how he first came to see hardship, pain, and suffering. First, he gave a sip of water to a person lying sick with fever. Next, he helped an old man with an aching, crooked back cross the road. Then he bowed his head to share a grieving family's sorrow. Siddhartha's heart felt heavy and his own eyes filled with tears. He could not stop wondering, how can I help others? You can do much good as a prince, the king told his troubled son. Siddhartha shook his head. Even the wisest ruler cannot stop sickness, old age, and death, he said. I want to find a way to help people live in ease and peace. And so, like seekers then and now and everywhere, the prince set off to find his way just as you may do someday. At first, Siddhartha looked to others for answers. He journeyed far and long and followed many different paths, but he still felt lost, like a little ship in a stormy sea, tossed by wind and waves. One day, Siddhartha came upon the welcoming shade of a tall, majestic tree. His spirits rose and he thought, perhaps the answer is inside me. I will stay in this pleasant grove until I find a way to peace. Then I can teach others too. And so Siddhartha crossed his legs in quiet meditation. Many days passed. Raindrops fell. Cool breezes blew. The sun beat down. And still Siddhartha sat, sheltered by the rustling heart-shaped leaves of an old and lovely tree. Once a woman named Sujata passed by and thought, he looks weak and hungry. She brought him sweetened milk and rice. She smiled and said, please accept this gift. If you are hungry, you should eat. Siddhartha tipped back the bowl to taste the delicious treat. The rice and milk was warm and sweet. Thank you for your kindness, he said. On that clear and brilliant night, waves still rippled the surface of his mind. But the prince just let his fears and worries come and go and kept breathing mindfully in and out, deep and slow. Soon, even the sighing heart-shaped leaves grew still, as serene as Siddhartha's mind. And then, just before dawn, he looked up. In the eastern sky, a bright planet appeared, the morning star. At that moment, like the swan so long ago, Siddhartha felt himself sore, aware, free, and fully alive. His worries fell away, and he saw clearly that all things fit together, big and small, hard and easy, joyful and sad. All part of one wondrous world. In a time long ago, and a place far away, a baby boy was born. His name was Prince Siddhartha. Today, we call him the Buddha, the Awakened One. Buddha did not stay alone under the heart-shaped leaves of the sacred Bodhi tree. Instead, he rose and went into the world to show the way of peace to others, then and now and everywhere. And yes, of course, to you and me.
There is always a light When we are ready to see it There is always a light When we are ready to be it To see the light, to be the light To raise our eyes in the dark of night To climb this hill Together we will there is always a light in the dark. We are ready to see this. There is always a light in the dark. We are ready to be it. To see the light, to be light, to breathe the rain in the dark of night, and be a gift. Together we will. There is always a light. There is always a light. We are ready to see it. There is always a light. There is always in the dark. We are ready to be it. To see the light, to be the light, to shine our eyes in the dark of night and be a kindness in this hill. We will. There is always a light. There is always a Be the light, to 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 be the Hello everyone, I'm Sriyani Rajapaksha and I will be reading you a Buddhist passage in Pali. Uh, this has become a part of our Visak ceremony uh, at UUFC um, uh, when we are celebrating uh, the Visak, which really stands for um, celebrating the three major events that happened in Buddha's life his birth, um, his enlightenment, and his passing away. All these three major events are said to have happened in the full moon uh, day of the month of May. And that's what's recorded in our uh, scriptures. And um, the, I have picked a very um, short but very uh, profound sutra for you. Uh, which I'm going to share the uh, verses with you uh, so you can follow along. Uh, this is Baddekaratta Sutra. It comes to us from Majjhima Nikaya. It's number 131 in the Majjhima Nikaya. And it come, it's a part of the Sutra Pitaka where all Buddha's uh, discourses are recorded. Okay. Uh, I have looked up uh, several different translations. Actually, I looked up three different translations of this sutra in English, and I picked one. Uh, this translation is by Venerable Nyanananda. Uh, he's a very uh, prominent um, uh, scholarly monk in Sri Lanka. He has written many books, and he um, has one book on this sutra. It's called Ideal Solitude and Exposition on the Baddekaratta Sutra. The word Baddekaratta itself is a combination of three roots. Badda is the first one, Eka, and then Ratta. So um, this long word is actually a combination of three words, uh, three separate uh, words, and they are uh, combined to call Baddekaratta. This sutra is um, now known as the Discourse on the uh, Lover of Ideal Solitude. So that's what Bhikkhu Nyanananda calls it, the Ideal Solitude. And this is the beginning of the sutra. Um, Thus have I heard, at one time the Exalted One was living at Savati in Jeta Grove, Anatha Pindika's monastery. There he addressed the monks thus. Vast majority of sutras begin like this. Who is this I? 
this is venerable ananda speaking these are his words venerable ananda is the chief attendant of the buddha he um, took care of buddha he attended to his daily needs and traveled with buddha uh, uh, everywhere uh, buddha went and it is also said that um, venerable ananda had a um, very um, good auditory memory he could remember every word that buddha spoke um, and one of the reasons buddha selected him to be the chief attendant is that reason that he has this excellent uh, auditory memory what we would call these days the um, having a tape recorder memory he could remember every word that buddha spoke not necessarily he understood its meaning but he could remember and recite it uh, and he actually recited this at the first buddhist council held three months after buddha's um, passing away which was organized by the other senior monks at the time to preserve his uh, teachings for the future so at the first buddhist council where it says 500 uh, uh, monks attended um, they invited venerable ananda to come and um, recite all the sutras and it, the first council lasted three months and every day they selected few sutras to recite so this is this is the um, occasion where venerable ananda repeated what he uh, heard thus have i heard at one time the exalted one was living at savati in jeta grove anathapindika's monastery so it all the sutras have a little bit of a background where did this happen where was buddha at the time so in this case buddha was at savati is which is a very um, a prominent city in ancient india and in there there was a, a beautiful park uh, a forest park called jeta grove and in the park a monastery was built by a, a lay a disciple of the buddha called anatta pindika and buddha spent many um, rainy seasons in this monastery and gave a uh, vast majority of sutras were actually delivered in this location so there he addressed the monks thus um, monks revered one the monks answered in answered the exalted one in ascent the exalted one spoke thus monks i shall teach you the summary and the exposition of the ideal lover of solitude listen and give full attention i shall speak even so revered one the monks answered the exalted one in ascent the exalted one said this so what follows is the actual um, passages from the sutra um, which i'm going to um, um, read the english translation first and then recite it in pali and then we are going to look at the uh, its meaning what it really means to us so now um, we're going to go back in time you can imagine 2550 2560 years ago now in india in a, a monastery in probably outdoors many of these were um sitting outdoors okay and um that's one of the reasons i picked a uh, outdoor setting for my background as well um okay so these are buddha's words as recorded by venerable anand let one not trace back the past or yearn for the future yet to come that which is past is left behind unattained is yet to come but that which is present here and now the practitioner discerns with insight as and when it comes the one who dwells thus ardently by day by night untiringly the tranquil sage calls the ideal lover of solitude the pali verse now okay atitam nam vagameya napati kanke anagatam 
yadati tam pahinantam apatancha anagatam pachupannancha yodamam tatta tatta vipassati evam viharam atapim ahorattam atanditam tam ve badrakhoti santo ajikate muni so these were buddha's words and i've looked up this uh, uh, the meaning of this sutra in several other places what does it mean to live alone the great buddhist master thich nhat han says knowing how to live alone doesn't mean you have to live in solitude in a cave separated from other people if we sit alone in a cave lost in our thinking we aren't really living alone living alone means living to have sovereignty over ourselves to have freedom that comes from not being dragged away by the past not living in fear of our future and not being pulled around by strong emotions caused by the circumstances of the present when we dwell in mindfulness day and night when we are truly practicing the better way to live alone this is true whether we are surrounded by friends and family or when we are living a truly solitary life so you can see it's now where we are it's it's um, what we do on the way daily zen journal says this is a very simple and essential teaching of the buddha on how to live fully in the present moment today many call this the mindfulness or mindfulness training not being lost in the past not dreaming of the future just be responsive to what's going on here and now and to fully engage in the present the bare bones of experience of living being in and of itself speaks more clearly of this teaching Venerable Nyanamoli is a British-born Theravada monk who lived in Sri Lanka and translated the entire Majjhima Nikaya, although it was not published. In the, his um, translation, he says, "But Dekarata appears as one who is applying oneself invincibly, unshakably to know and to study the present state as it occurs." this application or attachment is auspicious or fortunate because it leads to liberation so um the um the most important line from this sutra is that which is present here and now the practitioner discerns with insight insight has to be present with this uh, practice as and when it comes so we are live busy lives we have many tasks to take care of but even if you try to practice mindfulness or being in the present moment um for short periods of time it reduces your stress levels anxiety levels um because in the present moment there should not be any problems our problems come from our past uh, or thinking and planning about future um so even uh, very um brief moments of being here and now uh, is helpful but for a ardent buddhist practitioner um they are trying to or striving to be in this present moment uh for long periods of time Welcome to our annual Vesak service here at UUFC. This is the ninth year that we have celebrated this sacred Buddhist holiday together. And of course, it's the second one that we've done online. And I hope that next year for our 10th anniversary, we will be able to celebrate in this sanctuary together in person. So today in the Buddhist tradition, our sermon is called a Dharma talk. The Dharma talk is a way that Buddhist teachers share concepts from the Dharma. 
And dharma, if you're not familiar with it, is a Sanskrit term, which usually is translated to mean truth or the way, or just simply the teaching of the Buddha. So what I'd like to share with you today are some thoughts about how Buddhist wisdom, or the Dharma, can help us navigate these challenging and turbulent times that we live in. You know, it's so interesting to me that a set of teachings that came to us from 2,600 years ago, two and a half millennia, can still be so helpful to us in this time. That's incredible, isn't it, when you think about it, that a man who lived in the fifth century BC discovered some truths about human existence that still apply to us here in the 21st century, AD. So when Vesak comes around each year this holiday and we celebrate the three signal events of the Buddha's life, his birth, his enlightenment, and his death, I always tend to feel an immense gratitude for this gift that still is so helpful and so applicable. I'd like to read this morning a little snippet from Bhikkhu Bodhi. Bhikkhu Bodhi is an American-born Buddhist monk and scholar, and he has translated most of the original uh, Theravada scriptures from the Theravada school of Buddhism. And those are the ones that contain what are purported to be the original words of the Buddha. Bhikkhu Bodhi is a highly respected figure in both American and Asian Buddhism. And in the year 2000, he delivered a speech to the United Nations General Assembly, and that was to celebrate the very first official UN celebration of what they came to call Vesak Day. So I'd like to read um, just a little bit about Bhikkhu Bodhi's description of Vesak and the meaning of Vesak. He says, Vesak is the day marking the birth, enlightenment, and passing away of the Buddha, which according to traditional accounts, all occurred on a full moon in the month of May. Ever since the fifth century BC, the Buddha has been the light of Asia, a spiritual teacher whose teaching has shed its radiance over an area that once spread from the Kabul Valley in the west to Japan in the east, from Sri Lanka in the south to Siberia in the north. The Buddha's sublime personality has given birth to a whole civilization guided by lofty ethical and humanitarian ideals, to a vibrant spiritual tradition that has ennobled the lives of millions with a vision of humans' highest potential. His graceful figure is the centerpiece of magnificent achievements in the arts, literature, painting, sculpture, architecture. His gentle, inscrutable smile has blossomed into vast libraries of scriptures and treatises attempting to fathom his profound wisdom. Today, as Buddhism becomes better known all over the globe, it is attracting an ever-expanding circle of followers and has already started to make an impact on Western culture. Hence, it is most fitting that the United Nations should reserve one day each year to pay tribute to this man of mighty intellect and boundless heart, who millions of people in many countries look upon as their master and guide. So in our time together this morning, I want to look at a few important principles from the Buddha's teaching that I think are potentially life-changing in their capacity to fundamentally alter the way that we lead our lives. I don't think that's overstating it. And the five concepts that I'm going to mention are the parts of the Dharma that we can directly apply to the struggles and conflicts that we face every day, both in our personal lives and in the greater world around us. So first is the fundamental underpinning of all Buddhist teaching, the Four Noble Truths. In the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha lays out what Bhikkhu Bodhi calls his 
program of deliverance. In the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha states clearly that there is a lot of suffering in the world, that the cause of the suffering lies in our own minds, and that there is a way to end that suffering. Let me read what Bhikkhu Bodhi says about the Four Noble Truths. So this is again from his speech to the UN. He says, the Buddha not only makes suffering and release from suffering the focus of his teaching, but he deals with the problem of suffering in a way that reveals extraordinary psychological insight. He traces suffering to its roots within our minds, first to our craving and clinging, and then a step further back to ignorance, which is a primordial unawareness of the true nature of things. Since suffering arises from our own minds, the cure must be achieved within our own minds by dispelling our defilements and delusions with insight into reality. The beginning point of the Buddhist teaching is the unenlightened mind in the grip of its afflictions, cares, and sorrows. And the end point is the enlightened mind, blissful, radiant, and free. The Bodhi has quite a way with words when he's describing the Buddha. <laughs> so as our world becomes more divided and more conflictual, the Four Noble Truths reassure us that there is a way out of all this suffering, our own personal suffering and universal suffering. And with the Four Noble Truths, we begin to understand what causes suffering and how we can escape its grasp. We learn how we can ease our own suffering and assist others with their suffering. Second principle of Buddhist teaching that I want to mention is something called anicca. Anicca is a word from the Pali language, Pali being P-A-L-I, the language spoken by the Buddha. And the word anicca means impermanence. And this is one of what the Buddha called the three marks of existence. Impermanence is the truth that everything is constantly changing all the time, including us, right? Our bodies, our sensory experiences, our thoughts, our feelings, all of that in a ceaseless flow of change from moment to moment. And everything around us, outside of us, is also constantly changing. Never static, never solid, always evolving. All things, all beings, subject to this universal law of impermanence, or Nietzsche. So, of course, some of this is unsettling. It can be unsettling, even depressing, to think about impermanence. Because if nothing stays the same, if everything's constantly dissolving into something else, then where do we find meaning in anything? Well, ironically, it's, it's actually the opposite. If nothing stays the same, then every single moment of our lives is significant and precious, simply because each of those moments is utterly unique, will never be repeated. And to take this train of thought a little bit further, what that means is that we gain stability in the middle of chaos, seeming chaos. We don't try to hold on to anything because it's all changing anyway. And what this creates, again, kind of ironically, is hope. If we're in a difficult situation or we're confronting an injustice that we want to try to undo, then Nietzsche gives us hope that the situation or the injustice will eventually change. Like everything else, it's impermanent, so it will change. And that gives us a reason to go on trying, yes? To go on fighting, to go on working for positive change, because we know that everything will change eventually. Okay, the third thing that Buddhism offers us that I think is valuable is simply silence. Yeah, silence. We live in a very noisy world, don't we? 
And it's not just the noise of machinery and technology and just civilization humming around us. There's also the noise of humans. Lots of voices, lots of conflict, lots of argument. And for most of our waking hours, we're drowning in that sea of voices, that sea of information, um, information overload, emotion overload. And it's hard to stay afloat in those turbulent times. But in Buddhism, there's a practice called noble silence. We use it mostly when we're meditating, of course, or when we're on a silent retreat, but really we can use it any time that silence would be a welcome respite from this overpowering noise of the world. In all my years as a Buddhist, you know, I've fallen in love more and more with noble silence. It feels like a refuge to me and a place of peace amid those turbulent waters. Next, what uh, Buddhism presents to us as a gift are the pr dual practices of karuna and metta. Those are two more Pali words from the Pali language. You've probably heard me speak about them before. Karuna is compassion and metta is loving kindness. These are central practices of the Buddhist path and the Buddha prescribes specific meditative practices that will help us develop these virtues. Bhikkhu Bodhi points out that compassion and loving kindness, karuna and metta, can and should be practiced not only in our personal close relationships, but also in relating to the larger world. Here's what Bhikkhu Bodhi says about compassion and loving kindness. Underlying the specific content of a global ethic are certain attitudes of heart that we must try to embody both in our personal lives and in social policy. Chief among these are loving kindness and compassion. Through loving kindness, we recognize that just as we each wish to live happily and peacefully, so all our fellow beings wish to live happily and peacefully. Through compassion, we realize that just as we are each averse to pain and suffering, so are all others averse to pain and suffering. And when we have understood this common core of feeling that we share with everyone else, we will treat others with the same kindness and care that we would wish them to treat us. This must apply at a communal level as much as in our personal relations. We must learn to see other communities as essentially similar to our own and entitled to the same benefits as we wish for the group to which we belong. So related to all this is the final element of Buddhist teaching that I would like to share with you today. And that's the idea of skillful action. You might know that there is no concept of sin in Buddhism because there aren't any commandments which, if we break, we would pay a painful price. There is the concept of karma, the law of cause and effect, and there are precepts or training guidelines, we call them, which help us make wise choices. And most of all, we are guided by that principle of skillful action. So what is skillful action? So to distill it down to its essence, skillful actions are those that cause no suffering either to ourselves or to others. They're non-harming actions. They're helpful actions. So as you might imagine, if our actions are infused with loving kindness and with compassion, they will be skillful actions. Skillful action would also encompass such things as generosity, peacefulness, patience, benevolence, a whole host of things that maybe in Western culture we would call virtues. So to connect this element of the Dharma, skillful action, with our turbulent times and how it might help us respond to such things as racism and oppression and ecological destruction, 
It's an interesting sort of two-pronged process. At the same time that we expand the definition of skillful action outward into this turbulent world and how we live in it, we also want to remain aware that skillful actions spring from within. The source of our skillful actions, the wellspring, so to speak, is our practice of mental development, as the Buddha taught. Here's what Bhikkhu Bodhi had to say about this. The Buddha states that of all things in the world, the one with the most powerful influence for both good and bad is the mind. Genuine peace between peoples and nations grows out of peace and goodwill in the minds and hearts of human beings. Such peace cannot be won merely by material progress, by economic development, technological innovation, but it demands moral and mental development. It is only by transforming ourselves that we can transform our world in the direction of peace and amity. This means that for the human race to live together peacefully on this shrinking planet, the inescapable challenge facing us is to understand and master ourselves. It is here that the Buddhist teaching becomes especially timely. Even for those not prepared to embrace the full range of Buddhist religious faith and doctrine. In its diagnosis of the mental defilements as the underlying cause of human suffering, the teaching shows us the hidden roots of our personal and collective problems. By proposing a practical path of moral and mental training, the Dharma offers us an effective remedy for tackling the problems of the world in the one place where they are most directly accessible to us in our own minds. And in a nutshell, that is what we celebrate on Vesak. The Buddha's brilliance 2,600 years ago still shines brightly, and that light can lead us out of darkness. It reminds us that every moment is precious, and every moment contains the potential for peace. Thank you. We've come to the end of our service and we extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Thank you, Sriani and Jean, for sharing yourselves with us today and for us all being together in worship. Go in peace, my friends. Have a wonderful week.